This is Passive Monitoring with Nagios. Please welcome Jim Prince. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me in the back? You can. Actually, it sounds great. Yeah, this is uh, Passive Monitoring with Nagios. Um, I'm Jim Prince, and I'm going to talk through it. By show of hands, how many people are using uh, Passive Monitoring today with Nagios? OK. And by show of hands of those people, how many people are happy with your passive checks? Excellent. That makes two of us. Um, I wanted to entitle this uh, presentation, Things I Wish Someone Sat Me Down and Told Me Before I Started Working with Nagios Passive Checking. But uh, they insisted on this one. Um, a bit about me. I'm uh, Jim Prince. I'm the senior manager of web technologies at Harman International. So I uh, manage the uh, intranet, the extranet, our e-commerce sites, our brand sites for Harman, which is a uh, audio company. We use Nagios today for web application and server monitoring. We have about 180 hosts. Um, that's just for our web farm and about 1,100 services or 1,156. And one of the things I'm almost religious about is making sure that my monitoring system, my screens are clean and that there's no lingering um, checks out there that are distracting me from the real problems. And that's what I mean by all green lights. Uh, today, over the next uh, 40 minutes or so, we're going to talk about what the difference is between an active and a passive check. Active checks, I'm imagining most people here are pretty familiar with, and passive checks is the new thing. Um, how to enable passive checking in Nagios, um, in Core as well as in XI. Configuring NRDP. NRDP is one of the ways that you can send passive checks to the server, but there's a bunch, and I suggest pick the one you like and go with it. With passive checks, there's sort of three knobs and, uh, and switches that you mash up together to make the event that you're, or to make the response that you're looking for. And those are volatility, state stalking, and freshness checking. We're going to do um, one simple example, and then uh, one example that I think is, is really, really nice. And we'll talk about some other passive examples. We'll uh, summarize, and then Q&A. Um, if anything that I say strikes you as wrong, then uh, definitely jump in in the meantime and raise your hand and, and let me know, or if it's not clear. So to get started, what is a passive check? So active checks, like I said, are the ones that I'm assuming most people are familiar with. And those are scheduled on the server. They're active from the perspective of the Nagio server itself. The request gets initiated by the server, generally through the scheduler. The server gets authenticated by the client, like NS client plus plus or, or anything like that. And then the client decides whether or not to respond to the active check. And those are really appropriate for monitoring your disk space, your CPU utilization, things like that. Passive checks are the opposite. They are passive from the perspective of the Nagios application. The client initiates the request. The client gets authenticated by the server as they're sending their message in. And then the server decides whether to accept the message and also decides how to handle the message. Some uh, good reasons that I've found for using passive checks. And the first one is um, detecting and responding each time an event happens. So um, with that sort of requirement, you're going to use a passive check. You'll use volatility. And in some cases, you'll use uh, state stalking, which I'm going to talk about later. The other really powerful use case that I found is to detect and respond when something has stopped happening. Sometimes there's this thing that you know you want to happen. And there's many, many reasons why it could stop happening. And any of those reasons, you don't care which one, you want to know that that resulted in the thing you wanted to happen to not happen anymore. And that's uh, where you'd use a passive check with freshness checking. In Nagios Core, the way to enable passive checks are to go into that config.cfg file and set these uh, one or both of these directives, depending on whether you want to use host or service checks. Uh, to a one, they're, by default they're a zero. NRDP is a uh, PHP web, it's a service running on your Nagio server. Uh, it usually runs on your Nagio server in slash NRDP. It uses tokens 
to authenticate your clients with your server. So as you're preparing a client to be able to send information in, you're going to want to specify one or more tokens here. And then those tokens are going to end up in your um, send routine on your client side. And that's how they authenticate. That's how the server determines that it's OK for this client to send this request. Um, NRDP, the installation of NRDP, is a little bit outside of the scope of what I'm talking about. But this document was perfect for me. I didn't need anything else but this one. So um, feel free to use that. NRDP um, also comes with some client-side utilities that you can use. And uh, the one that I used is called Send NRDP. Um, what I did was I created a, a bash script where all these, are, these, uh, these parameters over here are the things that uh, generally don't change the location of your NRDP server, which is your Nagio server, the location of your send NRDP script, and the token that you're using. These four parameters, these are the things that do change depending on what it is that you want to send. These are the content of your message. So the first one says, this is the host I'm talking about. This is the uh, service. Uh, that I'm referring to. And this service name needs to match exactly with your service name that you define in uh, Nagios. This state of zero, and if you take one thing from the Nagios conference, if you're new to Nagios, it's this table right here. This is, this is sort of the underpinning of how Nagios works. Um, if your check script returns a zero, it means that everything's OK. If it returns a one, it means it's a warning. A two is a critical, and a three is, an un is uh, unknown. And finally, this output here that you're sending, this output is going to be displayed in your Nagio screen in your overview. So you want it to be something pretty descriptive, um, especially if it's a non-zero event or a non-OK event. And then this just uh, uses all those uh, parameters up here to call the send NRDP. You can uh, copy and paste this right from the presentation that's going to be available online. So the first of the three switches and knobs that we're going to talk about for passive checking is called volatility. And volatility is something that you would generally use with passive checks. You wouldn't want it so much with active checks, or maybe you would. Um, for non-volatile services, you're going to have, every time you, you check your service, it's either going to be OK or not OK. Um, with a volatile service, Every event that you receive is generally unique. Every event that you receive is something that you want to do it with. So if you have um, two security events like we show here, um, the fact that there was a security event here from this server doesn't negate or make less important the fact that there's a second security event that you want to respond to. And in that case, you want to use volatility to, uh, to alert you to each um, event that happens, each not OK event. In my experience, and, and people may disagree, but in my experience, a volatile service generally doesn't have a good news response. It doesn't get an OK. Um, it just, it's always bad news. With uh, volatility in Nagios core, when you're setting up your service or your host, you're just going to set that is volatile flag to 1 by default at 0. And uh, when you do that, What's going to happen is the following two things are going to start to happen for your alert. The first one is if you've defined an event handler for your service, which is that response action, that response action is going to happen for every single non-OK event. Uh, the other part is uh, if you've defined alerts to your mobile phone, um, you're going to get a lot of alerts if you have a lot of events. And, so, and a good thing to know is that notification intervals um, get ignored. So if you say only notify me about this every 60 minutes, um, it's going to ignore that for volatile services because by definition you want to know when these things happen, even if they happen more than once per hour. Does that make sense? Okay. The second option that generally goes along with volatility as a service parameter or a host parameter is something called state stalking. And state stalking talks about how Nagios logs the output messages that get received. By default, Nagios is only going to log, it's only going to log this message here when your status changes. So when your status changes from OK to warning, that'll get logged. But the next message won't be logged because the warning state stay the same. And then again, when it goes from warning to OK, that gets logged. This is important. It's important because um, you don't want to fill up your logs. And you also don't want to miscount how many events um, you have. So generally speaking, for a, an active service, this is the absolute appropriate um, thing to do. 
With volatility enabled, it works a little bit differently. What Nagios is doing here is it's checking not only your status, but it's also checking the message details. And when these message details change, it's also going to log those. Um, so in this example, you can see uh, the additional places where we're logging that we wouldn't have otherwise. So this wouldn't have been logged before, but with volatility enabled, it is. And the next slide shows why you'd want that. So in this case, we have a security device. The security device is sending us security alerts. Can, can you see that OK? You don't need to read the details. But um, for each security alert where the message doesn't change, um, we, we don't log it. But for everything else, we do. So these items in red are the ones that would be logged. And the items in gray are the items that wouldn't have been logged. So I don't need to know that this guy port scanned me twice. But I do need to know. Um, that I got a port scan, and then I got a heart bleed vulnerability scan, and then I got a SQL injection attempt, and, and those sort of things I want all in my logs. Again, session stalking. This document here on SourceForge was, was really, really clear on how it works, um, but I've, I had no issue with turning it on. The last parameter we're going to talk about is sort of a, a switch and a, and a Turning knob. Um, it talks about freshness checking. And freshness checking, when, when you have passive results, you're always showing the result of the last check you have. But sometimes you want to say, if the last check I have was a day ago or was an hour ago, then I want to throw up. That, that's a problem as well. I expect these things to be checking in regularly. That's where freshness checking comes in. In uh, Nagios Core, you're going to, on your service, you're going to set your check freshness to one, which makes it true. And you're going to set your freshness threshold to the time in seconds that you want it to wait before um, performing your, your freshness action. And this is sort of how it works. Um, I'm not really, really excited about stale criticals. That's just how it's defined. The, uh, when your freshness threshold gets exceeded, so when your service hasn't checked in in the amount of time you set for it, the response, what Nagios will do when that freshness, um, when it becomes stale, is it's going to run your check command. Your check command is generally in your active checks, the thing that you're checking for, but it's sort of unused in passive commands, so we use it here. Um, in this case, we're saying we're going to run the stale critical command, which is a custom command that we wrote, and we're going to use check period of 24 by 7. The, uh, the, the other thing you can do for freshness uh, checking is you can disable freshness checking based on a time period in Nagios. So generally speaking, I have never wanted to do that, so I always end up using 24-7. But just know that if you made it 8 by 5, it wouldn't check freshness thresholds until that next Monday morning. Yeah, and that's what I talked about there. The stale critical command is, uh, then needs to be defined in your commands, um, in your commands.cfg file. And the way you would do that is you would define a command called stale critical. In my case, all I want to do is have that respond back and say, this is a critical error, so I'm going to return a 2. And, and on the Nagio screen, I'm going to say that the passive service has not checked in. So let's talk about some examples. I wanted to make a really, really simple example, and one that we all understood after probably most of us have spent a bunch of time on a plane to get here. And that's um, how we could use Nagios to monitor the call button status on an airplane. So our requirement here is to just define the call button status for a seat as a service and create the ability to toggle that service on or toggle it off using our passive checks. So the button's going to report into the Nagios server and say, I'm on, I'm off. When it's on, I just want to call a warning. I don't, it's not a critical issue. There's more critical things that happen on an airplane than someone pressing a call button. Step one of this would be to define a passive service. This would happen on the, on the Nagios server itself. You define the service. You'd give it a host name. You'd give it a description. And remember, this is important. This needs to match exactly to what you send um, from the client. In this case, this is a volatile service. Every time it goes on or off, I want to uh, be notified about it. We're not going to have an active check. We're not going to call out to the button and say, hey, are you on? 
Instead, we're just going to uh, send a message every time the passive check um, gets triggered where the passive event happens. The second piece, using uh, NRDP, this is that same script that I showed you before, and feel free to, to copy this. Um, but we're defining our host, our service, our state of one, which is what we want it to be, a warning. If we wanted the call button to be critical, we just changed this uh, one over here to a two. And here's our output, and that output is going to end up up here. So that's the, uh, the action that we're going to trigger by that call button. Call answered, it's going to look almost exactly the same. These are going to be the same. We're going to set our state to zero, meaning OK. And we're going to set our output to call answered. And that's going to turn our lights green. Everything's OK. Everyone can relax. Everybody's being taken care of on the plane. So that's super, super simple. Does anyone have questions about, about how that would work? No. This next one um, is one that I think is really powerful. And if you're not doing it, I hope that you look and say, oh, gosh, that's a really good idea. This, this came straight from the um, user guide from the Nagios documentation online. Um, and this one was the requirement that our database backup should complete successfully every day. Uh, and there's lots of things that could prevent that from happening. Uh, we could have maintenance on the backup server. We could have a bad drive. We could have a, um, someone could have descheduled our backup job or our backup job could have failed. So instead of trying to test for every failure scenario, we just test for the success scenario and tell us when we haven't had success in, within our threshold. So the solution we're going to use is to send a passive acknowledgment upon the successful backup completion, and we're going to use that freshness threshold to alert us every time the freshness, um, every time the service hasn't checked in within 26 hours. And this is to make sure that if it, the job finished at 10 o'clock today and at 10.04 tomorrow, we're not raising flags. It now has until 12 o'clock to, uh, to check in. Again, the first piece we're going to uh, do is to define that passive service on, on Nagios. We're going to specify our host name and our service description. We're not going to use active checks. Um, you guys already know how to use those. We're going to use passive. We're going to check freshness by setting that to a 1. We're going to set our freshness threshold to 93,600 seconds, which is, if anyone's ever counted for 26 hours, that's what you would have gotten to save you the time. And the check command, which is the response when that freshness threshold gets exceeded, um, we're going to call no backup report. That's step one. Now we've got an event. And please don't try to uh, restart Nagios at this point, because it'll say, what is this check command? Right? I don't know what it is. I'm going to stay down until you let me know. Second piece is defining the check command. Again, in the commands.cfg file, we're going to define a custom command called no backup report. We're going to use uh, check dummy. This is not meant to offend you. This is just a script uh, that returns whatever you tell it after it. So in this case, check dummy is going to return that there's a critical error. And the critical error is that the results of the backup job have not been reported. Uh, you could also use unknown for this. I like to use critical because, in my experience, people don't know how to handle an unknown. And it's easier for them to wave it off and say, oh, I don't know. It's unknown. The third piece is to um, link a script. This is uh, the script we've written to our backup success message and our backup software. So if we're using a shell script to uh, backup, or if we're using a backup software that runs on Linux, then this sort of thing would, would work right out of the box. We're going to specify, here's our host, here's our service name, state's OK, and the message is the backup completed successfully. So every time the backup finishes, it's going to call into the server and say, my backup ran, everything worked fine, we're OK. What, what I did for this to make it a, a bit more interesting is I made a, another sample service. And, uh, and this one is a bit obsessive compulsive. But I've decided that on my, you guys probably can't see this very well, but on my, uh, on my airplane, I want seat cleaning to happen every five minutes. That could be terribly annoying. But for this example, we're, we're going to go with it. 
So right now, because seed cleaning hasn't happened in the past 19 minutes and 15 seconds, um, there's a critical alert that's been triggered. And we have a bash script, which we, uh, I can show you here. And our seed cleaning, just like we defined. Um, you guys have seen this before, but we're going to set it to zero. We're going to say our seat was cleaned. Here's our service name, which matches exactly what's in the uh, service definition. I'm going to run our script. So I'll just run that now for seat A1, which would probably mo be more appropriately called 1A if you've ever flown. So this is what the output of uh, send NRDP looks like. It's going to uh, send the check to the service. It's going to let us know that it sent it. Um, also, if you're watching the logs, your uh, nagios.log, you're going to see these details here. And this is really important because if you're trying to figure out why your passive events aren't working, the nagios log is a really great place to, uh, to go. There's also a debug flag that you can turn on for service checking. That's going to write all, your, all these sort of messages right in your var log messages, um, if that's where you want to see them. But either way, as long as you know where to look, it's pretty easy to troubleshoot why things are or are not working. So that turned that light green. Uh, that passenger can sit back down and spend the next four minutes and 55 seconds relaxing before the seat cleaner comes again. So that was, that was that. There's a bunch of other passive use cases. And there's a bunch of other talks about how to use um, passive checking for um, for some of these sort of things. And the first one is if your device is inaccessible that you're monitoring. So you've got a client that you want to monitor. It's behind a firewall. You can have that client call out to the Nagio server as opposed to the Nagio server calling back in uh, to the client using NS client plus plus or any of the check by SSH. So that's uh, one case. The second one is when the device is unpredictable. So if you have a device that's uh, moving around the network, a James Bond device, it's, uh, it's all around. You never know quite where it is. You can have that uh, check into the Nagios server, which is not moving around. And that's a good way to, uh, to keep tabs. And the third um, is scalability. And this is when you want to aggregate multiple Nagios server statuses up into one central server. You can use Nagios. Um, passive checks to report your checks in there. And I think that's called fusion. So those are uh, three other examples. In conclusion, uh, passive checks are supported both in Nagios Core and in XI. Um, I'm not aware of anything that you can do in XI with passive checks that you can't do in Core. Uh, although it's a whole lot easier to do them in XI, and I can talk about, I can show you that um, after we're done. The passive checks are initiated by the client, and they get authenticated and validated by the server. You can customize those with those uh, switches and knobs that I talked about, which are volatility, state stalking, and freshness checking. And they're useful for detecting when events happen, as well as when events stop happening. Um, the examples we used were on a technology called NRDP, and NRDP is a PHP-based uh, server component, runs on the Nagios server, that collects those uh, passive updates and submits them into Nagios core to be, um, to be processed. We talked about the fact that it uses shared tokens, so the, the client token has to match one of the tokens in the server side in order to be accepted. And there's a really good NRDP overview uh, linked here. When I first started using active checks, uh, because I was running on Windows, uh, the, I was trying to check the output status of a batch file, um, I found NSCA was a bit easier um, to, to work with. So like I said, pick one of the uh, technologies that you're OK with. And once it works, it's really easy to, uh, to modify to suit your needs. Are there any lost fans in the room? Yeah? Do you remember the Swan Station? There was a really creepy um, uh, premise where there was a guy in a hatch, and every 108 minutes he needed to type in a sequence of numbers or the world ended. Um, and I always imagined that that could have been uh, 
that, that could have been managed using Nagios, using freshness checking. Um, and it also, it, it, it could have been uh, remediated as well with an event handler. You could have just had someone go in and type the numbers for you, and maybe that plane wouldn't have crashed. Um, for uh, your team member status reports, this is I mean, anything you want to track, anything you want to see when it happens. Um, you would define a volatile service, so you would be uh, notified every time it, it happens. You would want to define your freshness to one month, and now when you don't get your monthly status report, you'll start uh, alerting them uh, automatically, save you the, the time. We talked a little bit about um, security events. These are passive volatile services for which state stalking should be enabled so that you get in your logs all of the uh, security events. That's something I actually wanted to talk about. When you send state stalking, when you start to log every event, then a lot of the reporting mechanisms that run uh, in CGI are gonna define those as outages, each one as outages. So you only wanna use it when you really need to. Uh, in this case, that makes a lot of sense. You wanna, you wanna record every security event and you wanna track every security event. But if you don't, then I wouldn't turn that on. It's gonna mess up your metrics. And we talked about the backup success, and I think this, I, I hope a lot of people walk away and go, gosh, this is a good idea, and I'm gonna use this. Um, the backup success message is just using freshness checking with a freshness threshold of 26 hours. So um, that's where the presentation ends and the, the uh, demo begins. We can, I, I'm, I'm happy to demonstrate each of these, uh, these items or answer any questions that you have. Here, he's coming to you in a second. So with the, with the freshness checking, I'm wondering um, if, you, if the Nagios server is restarted in the, in the midst of a 24-hour freshness check, is it, uh, is, is it able to pick up where it left off, or does a new 24-hour clock start? Absolutely. So, so what it's doing, so here's, here's an example of that freshness check, that, that obsessive compulsive seed cleaner. Um, what it's doing is it's checking the freshness date against this duration date, and that is the date the status last changed. So if you restart, unless you missed the check-in because the server was restarting in the midst, um, you're gonna be just fine to restart this. I can restart the server now and you'll see it. It continues to work. Because it's always uh, taking the freshness threshold versus this date here. Not the, yeah, the last check-in. Remember that passive checks are polling, but this, this guy's only gonna get a check-in when, when the client sends it. Uh, maybe I missed it or I just didn't, maybe I hadn't had enough coffee. Uh, it's early. What initiates the passive check? I understand you've got NRDP running on the client. So let's say your backup completes. So yeah, okay. What, what sends the check, what, what calls your check yeah. script? Got it. I understand. It's a really good question. Uh, in most backup software that I've worked with, uh, you can link scripts or batch files to, um, to the success or the failure messages of your backup. And so that's where you would run in. Um, I have an example of a batch file that, that sends a passive check as well as a, uh, a batch file, whichever you're using. But you would link that batch file to your success message in your backup software. Does that make sense? How does Nagios guarantee that the passive check makes it back to the main server? Is it just that freshness checking? That's a really good question. Um, the, Nagios doesn't guarantee that the, um, that the event's gonna make it back to the, uh, to the server. If the passive event fails, you'll get your return message. Um, let me see if I can demonstrate that. I'll just uh, take one of my scripts. Uh, let's say my server moved, and now my, uh, my IP address was not valid. Your return message Oh. <laughs> OK, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I think that, uh, that it, it doesn't. So your, if your event doesn't make it to the server, um, you're going to trigger that, that um, freshness check, and you're gonna have to troubleshoot why that happened. 
at least with NRDP. I, th there might be other technologies. There's a bunch of technologies to get a passive check from the client to the server. There might be a better one suited. Talking about um, NSCA versus NRDP, they both take two different approaches to how security works. Um, with, in, uh, in Nagios Core, you can configure both of them using, I'm sorry, in Nagios XI, using this inbound transfers area. Um, in NRDP, you're not restricting based on which IP addresses can send um, checks. You're, you're really authenticating through these tokens. With NSCA, you have one password instead of many, but you can limit access to who can send those checks um, in the configuration file to say only these servers, just like NS Client. You can say only these, uh, only these devices can send NSCA checks in. So the I would look and figure out which one is more appropriate from a security perspective and pick the right one for you. Do either or both of those uh, passive check sending solutions encrypt the payload? Um, NSCA does encrypt the payload. Um, NRDP, I don't believe does. So again, that might be a good reason. Uh, and there's a bunch of different uh, encryption and decryption methods. As long as you uh, use one of the, use, use the same one on the client and the server and use the same password, then, uh, then you're okay. What I like about NRDP is uh, NRDP is a lot easier to um, disable from the server side. You could just invalidate the token that you've assigned and, and now that server can't check in anymore if you feel like you've been compromised. Thank you. W would there ever be a case for using the, both a passive and an, a and, an, and an active check on the same service? I mean, you think in your monitoring, disk health on a server or something like that. What, what, I mean, I'm yeah, new to passive checks, so a, I don't really. From a distributed load perspective, it could be pretty easy to say, um, I want my client to send my, my disk storage, my, my, my storage percent used, um, if, using a passive check. But if it doesn't check in within three hours, then I'm gonna send an active check to it and try to get the results that way. And that certainly could be, uh, could be handled that way. So instead of linking an error message to your, to your command, you would instead link your active check. Right here. So instead of this being a custom command that returns an error, it would just be a, an active check. I think that would work. What else? I'm finally getting comfortable up here. Do we have any more questions? I'm actually pretty proud of you guys. This the first session of the morning. Jim, you really brought it out of this. There's a lot of questions, more questions than some of the sessions. The coffee must be working. So thank you guys, everyone, very much. And uh, how about a nice round of applause for Jim Prince.